Welcome, this is Information Service Engineering, lecture number five, Natural Language Processing, part four. In this section of the lecture, we are going to talk about word embeddings, one of the currently rather hot topics also in artificial intelligence. And this deals with the basic question, how do we represent textual data in the computer? So for sake of simplicity, what we are going to do is of course, we try to focus on the question, how to represent single words in the computer instead of, let's say, arbitrary textual data that doesn't harm anything. One of the very traditional solutions is that we try to represent words as unique integers associated with the words. Like, for example, we say movie is one, hotel two, apple three, movies would be four, art would be five, something like that. If you want to bring a bit, let's say, more flexibility in it, you could also choose prime numbers to individually identify single concepts and then also composed concepts that you try to, let's say, multiply. This is an idea um, which was proposed by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, famous uh, 18th century philosopher and, and mathematician. So you see, this is a rather traditional solution. Another thing, so this is now more like in computer science and how we do it, you could encode these kind of things in a type of vector for example, with the one hot encoding, which means for each single word that you want to represent, your vector has one dimension, one dedicated dimension directly for that word. And then for example, movie, then the first dimension of that vector would be a one, everything else would be zero. For hotel, it would be the second dimension or component. Apple would be the third, movies, the fourth and art would be five. So this is a so-called one hot encoding, which is rather standard for baseline solutions in computer science. So it's the most basic representation for any textual unit. So what you do there is you put all of your words into a vector space. Of course, it's a huge vector space, which means the dimension equals the number of words you want to represent there. And another thing, since it's a vector space in which each single word has its own dimension, it's a vector space. This means word vectors constitu constitute a so-called orthogonal base. Orthogonality means that each vector is orthogonal to each other vector. There is no similarity. There is nothing. They are orthogonal. And the other thing is, of course, um, they are normalized, which means you multiply it by itself, then it's one. So it's a normalized uh, orthogonal base that we see here. It's not weighted or anything else like that. Problems, of course, related to that kind of vector space approach. We also said it's so similarity between the single words is not considered. So there is no relation to semantics. So for example, car and automobile are two different orthogonal vectors. However, they are synonymous in real life, but they are completely different, which means orthogonal in the vector space. So no similarity can be seen here. As well as all words that you consider do have the same distance, so they are equidistant, which means if I look at the difference between cat and dog, it's the same like the difference between proton and carrier. Of course, the difference is not the same in real life. Another problem is polysemy. What are you doing if you know one word stands for several concepts? So for example, jag jaguar, the cat, should that have the same vector as Jaguar the car? I mean, depends on, but if you want to really make sense and put semantics in it, then this kind of one-hot encoding will probably or potentially not work. So besides that one-hot encoding, another way to represent now words in the computer would be a feature-based representation, which means we do not take, let's say, one vector per word, but we try to find some features and relations between these features or relations between single words and try to encode them and characterize the words then by their features. Potential features would be morphological features. So what of the word is a prefix? What a suffix, a stem, a lemma? So what's the stem and the lemma of the word? So this is not the word itself. However, if you, for example, take only the stem, then you would see that between car and cars, of course, there is a similarity. They end up then in the same stem. So which means or would be an indicator for similarity. Another thing would be grammatical features. 
part of speech, for example, if you take into account part of speech, you could very likely, let's say, distinguish polysemous words. Or you can take into account gender or the number, is it singular, is it plural, as well as structural features. So is it written with a capital letter? Is it written with a small, a lowercase letter? Uh, is there a hyphen? Are there digits involved in there? So how is it composed? What's its structure? Or you look at relations. You look at, you know, what is synonymous? What is antonymous? So what is the same? What is the opposite? You look at hyper and hyponyms. What is a more general? What is a more specific word? Or you look at meronyms and holonyms. Which thing or word is part of another thing or vice versa? So these are potential relations that, for example, you might also find in uh, dictionary-like structures like WordNet, as we had in one of these uh, notebooks, as you might remember. The problem here again is, of course, um, if I then want to annotate or to determine all of these features for the single words, this requires usually a high manual effort. And if you have then many annotators who annotate that, there might be even annotator disagreement and you have to deal with it somehow. Then another thing is accuracy and as well scalability. So these are a few issues that are related to feature-based representation of words because you also have to distinguish, yeah, let's say, how important is this feature for a specific task that you have in mind to represent the words there? And, and this is uh, also a thing which is not easily automized in, in some way. However, since we are dealing nowadays with um, machine learning and also then with uh, interesting network architectures like convolutional neural networks, lots of this kind of feature engineering will be also learned by the machine. But we will see this then in chapter number four. Okay, so these were one traditional and one vector space encoding, and the other thing was feature-based encoding. Is there another way to encode or to better represent words? So we see one of the important issues there is the meaning of the word that should be somehow represented also in the computer. For that, let us lean back and let's try to focus again on the question, what's the meaning of a specific word? Now you might wonder why I show you exactly this picture of a, of a man standing next to a horse and the horse stands in front of a school blackboard. This, may I introduce to you, is Clever Hans. Clever Hans? was a rather popular and famous horse in the beginning of the 20th century. And it was said that this horse is able to understand human natural language and that this horse was able to do arithmetics and answer questions like, for example, like single arithmetic tasks to solve. So let's say to compute the sum or uh, the, the division or something like that or multiplication. So the horse knew it. You might now wonder how and did the horse really understand language? But for this story, um, I have to tell you, we have to wait until chapter four, until deep learning. Then I will tell you the entire story of Clever Hans and how in the end this riddle about this really intelligent horse was solved. But now again, what's the meaning of a word? We all remember here the semiotic triangle. We know that a word which refers it to a symbol, stands for a specific object in the real world or for an abstract object. And it symbolizes a concept. And as well, the concept refers to the object. And somehow this, of course, was a rather interesting, uh, let's say, um, explanation that also told us that to understand the semantics, which is the meaning of a word, we are dependent on context, on experience, on pragmatics. So there are many factors which in the end influence it. But context means we have not only to look at the word itself, we have to look left and right. So how is this word going to be used? In which context? And the context we know is determined by pragmatic. So it depends on the speaker or the sender of the message which contains words, how he phrases and expresses that to reach or to achieve a specific intention. Of course, this is a question for philosophers. And here we meet another famous guy. This is Ludwig Wittgenstein, famous language philosopher. And he came up 
with the definition of the meaning of a word to say the meaning of a word is its use in the language. Which means this is kind of a so-called distributional representation of words, which means I can probably characterize a word by determining how it is used. So what's the context? What are the words in front? What are the words after? Of course, this is an interesting idea. So we can say in particular words might be defined by their environment, so by the words around them. Already here in 1954, Selig Harris said, if words A and B have almost identical environments, so if left and right always is used in the same way, we might say that they are synonyms. Thereby, semantic representation for words can be derived via the analysis of patterns of lexical co-occurrences, so which words co-occur together with our words in a large text corpus. And J.R. Firth summarized exactly this notion of distributional representation by you shall know a word by the company it keeps. You think this doesn't work? Let's make a small experiment. Okay. Ong Joy. What's Ong Joy? So I'm not asking, let's say, uh, friends uh, who are uh, knowledgeable, let's say, of some Asian language. So what is Ong Joy? Suppose you see the blue sentences here. Ong Joy is a delicious sautéed with is delicious sautéed with garlic, or Ong Joy is a superb. Oh, sorry. Ong Joy is superb over rice, or Ong Joy leaves with salty sauce. That already, yeah, gives you an idea what it might be. So this can be something to eat, and you might already know that uh, spinach sautéed with garlic over rice is also delicious. So it might be related to spinach because it's used in the same way so you see it with the words here you also might have seen that chart stems and leaves are delicious of course other things are also delicious or you might see uh, that collard greens and, and other salty leafy greens are mentioned somewhere so the point here is the conclusion on joy is some leafy green like spinach chart or or collard greens so you see that already by what we know around Ong Joy, this already gives us an idea what the meaning of that word might be. And really, actually, Ong Joy is nothing else but so-called water spinach. So you almost, almost guessed it, didn't you? So this idea means we want somehow to represent a word in a statistical manner how it is used. So we simply represent or take the context as a characterization of a specific word, which means we again want to somehow create vectors which represent this kind of context to determine exactly the meaning of a word. And if we do this cleverly in a vector space by learning, let's say, the single values then that this vector should have in a way that synonymous and rather similar things are close together because they have of course a similar environment and things which are different are farther apart we end up in a vector space like the word vecting uh, word vector vector space so this combines distributional intention so this is a statistical language model and vector intention which means I arrange it in a way that semantically similar words are nearby in the vector space. And this is called an embedding since, you know, it's embedded. So the meaning is embedded in, in, in that vector space. And this now has become a standard way to represent meaning in natural language processing. We distinguish usually between sparse and dense vectors. So in information retrieval, for example, often these uh, sparse vectors are used. So there you, you have something like a one hot encoding. However, it's not really one hot because you are representing there, let's say entire co-occurrences by counts, not only by counts, but also sometimes you do this by TF-IDF, which is also a standard, let's say measure in uh, information retrieval to determine the importance of a single word for a document. So you take the, the term frequency and you divide it by 
the logarithm of the uh, inverse document frequency, which gives you something like the importance of the word. But you do this again with your entire vocabulary. So you have one dimension for each vector there. And then these are sparse vectors that have 20,000 to 50,000 dimension, which means most of its dimensions are zero. So most elements of that vector are zero. So they are rather sparse. In difference to that, the more modern word to vec vector spaces, this is a representation that is created by training a classifier to distinguish nearby and far away words. So here, the values of the vector are learned by training. And it's interesting because you use here much shorter vectors. They only have 50 to 1000 dimensions usually, and they are dense. So most elements are non-zero. We will go deeper into word to vec and how this works then later on in the uh, chapter four when we talk about machine learning. But only to show you what is possible also to keep what kind of semantics. It's not only that similar things are rather close to each other, it's also that relations can be mapped here. And for example, the difference here between male and female, as you can see, is like the difference between king and queen. It's like verb tense that you see here. So between swam and swimming, the difference that you see here is likely like the difference between walked and walking. And it even works for the relation between, let's say, a country and its capital. So if you see here the relation in the vector space between Spain and Madrid, Italy and Rome, Germany and Berlin, the difference between both, this is the vector distance or the, uh, the, the vector difference is rather similar, which means you can use exactly this kind of vector arithmetics to do analogies, for example, which is, of course, a rather interesting thing and also means that the semantics of the single words is very well represented within these kind of vectors. Of course, the single word to vec embedding also has lots of drawbacks. Probably we will talk about that. but. Um, this field has developed and now there are much more sophisticated embeddings available, like for example, BERT, you might have heard that. Okay, so much for vector embeddings, word embeddings within NLP. Here we are at an end with our NLP session. However, this topic then we will continue later on in chapter four, machine learning. But in the next lecture, we start over to a complete new section and then we are going to talk about knowledge graphs.